Dear colleagues, a warm welcome to the third Ongo Alert Colloquium, this year being held in partnership with the American Society for Radiation Oncology, the European Cancer Organization, the European Society for Gynecological Oncology, the European Oncology Nursing Society, the European School of Oncology, eCancer, the International Society for Geriatric Oncology, the Multinational Association of Supportive Care in Cancer, and the SWAL Cancer Research Network. Together, we bring you this end of the year review of the Best of Oncology 2022, from trials to publications, drug approvals to current controversies within our field and future trends in treatment and research. This colloquium will last six days from January 23rd to January 28th, 2023. Links will appear on social media and you can always find them via our website, oncoalert360.com. And there you can find the colloquium webpage you will find the possibility to subscribe to our newsletter and we will send you the links daily. This colloquium is independent of any financial support and comes to you as a result of our partners and our faculty working hard in order to drive the field forward, regardless of geography. There is no sign up, no information acquired or tracked. You simply click and watch. We truly hope that you enjoy this colloquium as much as we enjoyed making it. All the presenters have added their Twitter accounts at the bottom, and this was done in order to facilitate networking, contacting, and education. The days are separated by specific tumor groups, and our aim was to give you as much of a multidisciplinary approach as possible. Although we apologize to our surgery colleagues, we promise to have this included for our fourth colloquium. The daily links to the colloquium will be active at 12 noon EST, New York time, and 6 p.m. CET Stockholm time. Once the presentation has been streamed for the day, it will be available to you on demand, and we highly encourage you and thank you for sharing it with all your colleagues at your institution to truly amplify the knowledge coming out of our faculty. Another way of receiving the links daily is always by signing up to our newsletter at www.oncoalert360.com. Today is day four of the colloquium, focusing on the best of gynecological oncology in 2022 in the ESCO session, followed by melanoma, sarcoma, and finishing off with the ECHO sessions. We are now joined by a fantastic faculty, Dr. Mansour Mirsa of the Rix Hospital at Denmark, presenting the updates on ovarian cancer, Dr. Keta LaRusso of Catholic University Rome, Italy, presenting on endometrial cancer, Dr. Christina Fotopaulau of Imperial College London, UK, presenting on ovarian cancer surgery updates. And we move on to melanoma presented by Dr. Alison Beth of Warner, formerly from Memorial Sloan Kettering, now of Stanford Oncology. And finishing up with an echo session by Dr. Miriam Krul of Amsterdam University Medical Center, Netherlands. Now, without further ado, Dr. Mercer. Hi, this is Mansour Reza Mirza. I'm clinical oncologist from Copenhagen. Uh, and I want to discuss with you uh, the, the non-surgical uh, therapy of ovarian cancer, systemic therapy, um, basically of uh, advanced disease and metastatic disease. The classical first-line therapy is primary surgery and six cycles of paclitaxel carboplatin. Uh, however, if you cannot operate patient up front, uh, uh, if you can, uh, if you do not have, if you can foresee that this patient won't have a radical uh, surgery, um, patient gets new adjuvant chemotherapy, three, about three cycles of carboplatin bactitaxel, reevaluate, do that uh, uh, interval debulking surgery, and continue the uh, uh, treatment again with three cycles of paclitaxel carboplatin. This treatment has been there for many, many years. Um, and, 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 and actually what we could see that this treatment had a quite a high response rate of more than 75% patients going into complete or partial remission. Uh, however, when we did the second assessment uh, surgery, uh, we found out that more than 40% of the patients had uh, complete remission and uh, uh, clinical complete remission was over 50%, but pathological complete remission, even though 40%, uh, the recurrence in two years was very high, 
uh, and 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 the, the most of these patients recurred within two years and uh, otherwise almost all uh, patients about 80 percent of the patients recurred uh, in uh, in the late uh, stage and so we needed ac um, additional therapy uh, to to get to reduce the risk of recurrence and that was the well, that's why we started on working on maintenance therapy and we tried everything almost you can see the long list i'm not going to run through that uh, but all this has not changed um, uh, survival uh, haven't given any survival benefit however lately anti-angiogenic therapy with bevacizumab uh, did provide benefit uh, and we saw the results of two phase three trials in first line GOG218 and ICON7 both of these trials giving chemotherapy uh, carboplatin paclitaxel and then uh, randomizing to add bevacizumab for 12 to 15 months uh, and 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 both trials showed that there was survival benefit. Uh, there were progression-free survival benefit, which was modest, but it was there with a hazard ratio of 0.73 in 218 and um, and and 0.87 in ICON7, and that that uh, uh, made uh, gave us approval to use pevacizumab in first line, uh, and we uh, continued using that for more than a decade now. Uh, however, we always uh, discussed why we had to stop uh, bevacizumab after 12 or 15 months. What if we continue treatment for longer period? As you can see that when you stop the treatment, these curves fall into each other. Um, so, so we did another trial, uh, the, the um, uh, BOOST trial. And this trial was asking a question, if we continue bevacizumab for a longer period, for 30 months uh, compared to 15 months, which is standard of care, if you will get a better outcome. Unfortunately, the trial results were negative. We did not see any survival benefit uh, at all um, in these patients. So the standard of care remained uh, bevacizumab uh, for 15 months uh, in stage three and four disease. Uh, but then we got introduced PARP inhibitors. I think that has really changed our uh, uh, outcome of our patients. Um, so why PARP inhibitors? If you look at the uh, patients, most of these patients, 75% of these patients will have uh, will be high-grade serious ovarian cancer. And um, there are uh, this, this, this is a very heterogeneous disease, although we call them all high-grade serous. Uh, you will see about 25% of these patients having BRCA mutations. Another 25% of the patients will have other deleterious mutation, uh, chromosomal damage resulting in similar biology as BRCA1 and 2 mutations. So altogether, that half of the patients uh, we call uh, homologous recombination deficient. Um, and uh, you can see the right side of the pie and the left side of the pie, we call them homologous recombination proficient. So uh, how does PARP work that, that you see highest efficacy on this half and only moderate efficacy on the other half? So PARP inhibitors, uh, how it works is you can understand simply if, if we say that there are always uh, DNA uh, damage, um, single strand breaks in cells, and they are very well repaired by uh, PARP enzyme. However, if you block PARP enzyme uh, by giving PARP inhibitors, you will not repair uh, the single strand break. And then cell, when it divides into two, will have double strand break. Even double strand breaks can be very well repaired by homologous recombination repair mechanism. However, in the BRCA mutated uh, cells, uh, this mechanism is not functioning uh, uh, or the other, bio, as I said, other def defects we have uh, which behave like BRCA1 or 2, uh, the, the, this HR repair function is not functioning. And if you have BRCA mutation or BRCA-like mutation, this cell by, by uh, blocking uh, PARP enzyme by PARP inhibitor, you will uh, make this cell to die uh, and will not go for, for further uh, 
replication and uh, uh, so, so this is a very simple mechanism one can understand but it's not that simple there are quite a few mechanisms i'm not going to go in detail of that um, so what we saw was the maintenance therapy really started uh, 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 showing efficacy first as i said we saw the uh, efficacy of gog218 and icon 7 with bevacizumab and then jonathan letterman presented uh, uh, study 19 uh, in patient uh, platinum sensitive relapse patients uh, with uh, PARP inhibitor or laparib. And after that, uh, we saw the phase three trials of PARP inhibitors also in relapse setting. The NOVA trial was the first phase three trial. And then we saw the uh, other trials uh, coming in with, with, with uh, uh, SOLO2, uh, Arial3. And uh, later we saw also um, first line treatment uh, approvals. The first first line treatment trial results we saw in ESMO 2018, uh, that was solo one, and 2019 we saw two major uh, trials, uh, Prima and Paula one. Uh, and this uh, last year we saw another couple of trials, trial results. And I'll show you how we have changed the landscape gradually. Let's start with the first line uh, treatment first. So maintenance PARP inhibitors in first line, as I said, there are five trials which have shown efficacy. Uh, the three of them first were there in 2018 and 19 and gave us approval. So let's look at the design of those three trials. Um, uh, or, uh, and uh, another trial, fourth trial, which is not giving any approval. So I will not discuss that. That's failure really trial. Um, so, so all these trials have one thing in peculiar. These patients receive chemotherapy, uh, and upon response, uh, after that, they are randomized to PARP or placebo. Uh, but these trials are very different with population. For example, SOLO1 is only in BRCA mute. For example, in PRIMA trial, we did not allow patients with stage 3 disease to have no residual disease. Uh, so that was quite a high group. So uh, and and in Paula one actually the uh, the treatment was not chemotherapy alone, but chemotherapy plus bevacizumab. So the trial is uh, randomizing to uh, elaborate plus bevacizumab or uh, placebo plus bevacizumab. So you can see these trials are very different in design in population. You cannot compare against each other. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how the efficacy has been according to the molecular classification, which we saw earlier. So if you look at the BRCA mute population, the BRCA mute, which was one fourth of the patients, you see that all these trials are extremely beneficial. And now we have long-term results uh, of both SOLO1 and PAULA1 and PRIMA. Uh, and SOLO1 and PAULA1, we can see that there is a clear survival benefit uh, while we are still waiting survive, over, overall survival results for PRIMA trial. Uh, so when we go to the uh, uh, BRCA wild type population, but still keep it to HR deficient uh, population, uh, there uh, SOLO1 was, did not have any, any patients. There, that SOLO1 was performed only in BRCA mute population. The other two trials are showing clear benefit of adding a PARP inhibitor in Paula, the uh, Laparib plus Bevacizumab, uh, and in Prima Niraparib. So again, a very strong benefit. Uh, and as I said, in Paula, we have already seen overall survival benefit um, in it. When it comes to the uh, HR proficient disease, the left side of the pie, which you saw earlier, uh, you see moderate efficacy in prima trial with neuroparib. You don't see any uh, benefit of adding neuroparib to bevacizumab against bevacizumab in Paula 1. So here one have, uh, you can discuss how we want to treat these patients. You have two options. Um, you have either bevacizumab or neuroparib. You can treat these patients. Uh, or uh, there is also some some. Uh, investigators feel that they can leave uh, and give no treatment, let's say if it is a stage 3 C disease with no residual disease, 
um, some some investigators won't treat these patients with maintenance therapy. I don't I don't think that's a very good idea because quite few of these patients will end up have, becoming platinum resistant, and then you won't have possibility to give PARP inhibitors to these patients. So. Um, uh, I think that maintenance therapy must be given uh, to these patients, either neuropathy or uh, bevacizumab. And 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 one can always discuss how which one you want to uh, uh, choose. Uh, uh, the best is that you um, discuss with the patient, look at the patients uh, uh, if there is any uh, contraindication for one or the other drug before you choose uh, treatment. So so. Um, uh, according to these three trials, we received approvals both in European Medicines Agency and in FDA uh, for uh, all patients uh, in uh, uh, with high uh, high serious ovarian cancer or epithelial ovarian cancer. Um, uh, if patient uh, uh, is BRCA mute, you could give treatment according to all three trials. If patient is HRD positive BRCA wild type. Uh, you could use uh, either treatment uh, like PALA1 or uh, like um, uh, Prima. And if you have uh, possible, if the patient is HR proficient, you still have possibility to give neuroparib to these patients. So there we stand today uh, with the treatments. Last year, we saw results of two more trials. Um, early last year, we saw the results of PRIME trial. Uh, which is done in uh, uh, in Chinese population, and patients were randomized to neraparib or placebo. And as you can see, both in uh, non-GBRCA, uh, uh, actually it was positive in both in uh, GBRCA and non-GBRCA. And within non-GBRCA, if you look at the HRD and HRP, there is no difference there. Uh, efficacious in both uh, subgroups. However, here the HRD test is performed uh, by uh, 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 in a different way, the uh, VGI test, which we really don't know what it is. So we have to dig into it before we understand this mechanism. The last, at last ESCO, we saw the results of the uh, first part of Athena trial, uh, which was the two arms, uh, uh, Rucaparib or placebo. And we saw similar effect, um, similar efficacy as we saw in uh, the PRIMA trial that all patients, regardless of HRD, uh, were responding. Highest response was in BRCA mute population, moderate in the uh, so-called HRD negative population or elevation low population. Um, so, so as you can see, that PARP inhibitors have really covered the area and increased the uh, 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 improved outcome of our patients. We saw in this ESMO beautiful overall survival results. We saw the seven-year uh, data on uh, solo one, uh, uh, where still 40% or more than 40% of the patients have not uh, progressed, um, and uh, about half of the patients have not died. So I believe that these patients are cured. Why I believe that? Because if you look at the survival curves from five to seven years, there is a very little uh, uh, change, about 4%. And if you look at the same age, a woman who do not have uh, cancer and what is their risk of dying of something, uh, it's some, somewhat similar. So it is the natural uh, course of our, uh, uh, our uh, life. And that's why I believe that these patients are probably cured. Um, so just a short notice on another thing, what we have done, discussed a lot is immune therapy. We have now done uh, quite a few trials with immune therapy, two of them in first line, uh, which have shown no benefit of adding immune therapy, either to chemotherapy or to chemotherapy plus bevacizumab. So that's quite depressing. Uh, however, we would uh, see um, uh, results of many new trials which have uh, which have concluded recruitment. Uh, they are asking the question of adding 
immune therapy, immune checkpoint inhibitors to PARP inhibitors, plus minus bevacizumab will have benefit or not. So it, uh, uh, I'm really looking forward to see the results because until now we have not seen any positive results of uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors. Let's move on to the relapsed disease, so-called platinum sensitive disease, or where platinum is an option. There we have um, uh, shown with the phase three trials that doublet, carboplatin doublet is the standard of care. The last trial we did, the Calypso trial was carboplatin PLD versus carboplatin bactitaxel, which showed that carboplatin pagylated liposomal doxorubicin is uh, better tolerated and probably a little bit superior. So that's why this is in uh, most of the country's standard of care. So what maintenance therapy we have achieved with uh, in, 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 the, the, in relapsed disease. Again, we go to this pie and you can see that we saw oceans and a, a, a trial coming in uh, uh, in platinum sensitive and then other trials I will show you and all the PARP inhibitor trials later. So if you look at the bevacizumab role, I think we have clearly shown that bevacizumab do have uh, efficacy in uh, patients who receive, who have platinum sensitive relapse, patients who are receiving chemotherapy can, were randomized to receive on top of that concomitant bevacizumab uh, and maintenance therapy. And you can see that 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 all these trials are positive, um, especially the trial on the right side, the NGOTOV17 is important because all these patients have received bevacizumab before and they are retreated with bevacizumab. And interestingly, you can see that there is benefit of bevacizumab uh, uh, in, in, in this population. So one thing when we can learn from that, platinum sensitive, you have three positive trials. You have probably survival benefit or in the GOG213. And third thing that the bevacizumab after bevacizumab is effective. However, at least in Europe, we don't have approval for that. So we are not allowed to prescribe bevacizumab after bevacizumab. We can only give bevacizumab once in the course of patient's disease. Let's move on to, again, to PARP inhibitors here. As I said, the first study performed, that was phase two study, study 19 by Jonathan Letterman, the uh, LAPRIP study, and that was confirmed uh, 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 only in the BRCA mute population. It was confirmed by SOLO2. Um, and the first phase three trial actually was uh, NGOTOV16, NOVA trial. And then we lately saw results of uh, other trials as well. Uh, so very short about study 19, uh, when it was presented in all whole population, again, in the same design, as I said, the patients receive chemotherapy, platinum doublet, and once they are in response, they are randomized to receive here a lap rape or placebo until progression of disease. Uh, one thing I forgot to tell you, in the first line, we have given PARP inhibitors for two or three years, and then we paused, uh, and we actually, uh, um, here, uh, we in all the relapsed patients, we have given PARP inhibitors until progression of disease because we are afraid that these patients uh, do need PARP inhibit. Uh, the, if they are benefiting, they need treatment until they progress. Uh, Jonathan went back and did the subgroup analysis, and the BRCA mute population showed that. Uh, uh, unprecedented uh, efficacy with a hazard ratio of 0.18. Um, and also in BRCA wild type, there was a hazard ratio of 0.54. So the, the whole population was responding. However, uh, the label on behalf, uh, because of this was given to BRCA mute population. And we already in 2013 had possibility, to, uh, 2014 had possibility to prescribe uh, PARP inhibitor uh, according to uh, according to this trial. The confirmatory trial was performed that was SOLO2. This is the overall survival on uh, st study 19. Just to say a uh, comment on overall survival, all these data are, uh, 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 are, are non-analytical uh, because uh, alpha was not allotted to them. So these are uh, exploratory and not uh, not uh, uh, 
we cannot clearly can we haven't controlled the any treatment after progression and we haven't really controlled the uh, overall survival data so it's it's difficult to say that uh, what is right and what is wrong but it gives us a trend here you can see the trend a positive trend that that alaparib have patients who received alaparib have overall overall survival benefit <clears throat> the confirmatory trial was solo 2 uh, and there you saw the same. You saw very positive uh, efficacy that was BRCA mute population alone. And if you look at the overall survival, you also see a trend towards uh, overall survival. I say trend because uh, again, alpha was not allotted. So these are non-analytical uh, endpoints. Uh, the first phase three trial was a uh, NOVA trial and their patients were randomized the same way, but patients were actually divided into two subgroups, g mute and non g mute. Within non g mute, there were two primary endpoints, one in HID population and when I, one was HID negative population. So if you look at the results in the mute population, uh, the PFS, which was primary endpoint, shows a tremendous benefit. And if you look at the rest of the population, non G BRCA gain, you see a, a, a great benefit um, uh, of median PFS and and uh, all of uh, and the hazard ratio. <clears throat> Within that uh, non G BRCA, if you look at the HRD, um, uh, again you see a, a, a clear benefit with a hazard ratio of 0.38. So very positive trial. Unfortunately, the trial had uh, uh, did not control for overall survival, and the patients who were asking for unblinding, they were uh, excluded from the study. So, twenty-five percent of the patients, we don't know what they received after they were they progressed, and that makes it very difficult to draw any conclusions on overall survival, uh, which is uh, which is uh, here as you can see. Uh, in the G BRCA mute and non G BRCA mute population, uh, you don't see any any uh, any tendency. It's close to one, um, and 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 that makes it quite difficult, um, uh, but uh, to interpret. But 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 the problem is that we have not really controlled for OS at all in uh, Nova study. Aerial 3 uh, was another trial which was with Rocaparib in the same, somewhat the same uh, design as a NOVA trial and showed somewhat the same um, outcome in the progression free survival in all three subpopulations. Uh, so Aerial 3, Rocaparib got approval uh, due to that as well. And again, we see the same issue when the, the, uh, the, Overall survival uh, data is non-analytical and it's difficult to interpret. So it's difficult to say that uh, that that the the data shows a negative effect. I would say that uh, in this case it would be zero effect because there are quite a few factors which make it impossible uh, to withdraw conclusions on OS data. I think we have to look at the uh, side effects, some special side effects of PARP inhibitors. In the relapse setting, we saw that the rate of MDS and AML was higher um, in solo one, eight percent of the patients, uh, and in um, against uh, uh, against uh, placebo, which was four uh, percent. Why is that? Probably because we are doing, we are maintaining the DNA damage. Uh, one thing and second thing is these patients have received multiple lines of uh, chemotherapy and uh, with cis blood, with uh, carboplatin and platinum is also the DNA damage agent so you can see the baseline is also high we don't see this high risk of MDS AML in first line uh, the risk remains quite low at less than one percent uh, and probably because they have received first of all only um, one line of platinum, and they have received only two or three years of PARP inhibitors. So, so these things you have to think while you are deciding when to give PARP. I would rather give PARP inhibitor in first line and not wait for the relapse setting. Lately, the last year we saw, the, uh, or, or a few years ago, we saw the data of uh, NORA trial, which is a very uh, uh, 
um, similar trial to NOVA trial in Chinese population showed clear benefit by giving a uh, PARP inhibitor uh, niraparib against placebo. Uh, and if you look at the GPRACA, non-GPRACA, you have efficacy everywhere. And uh, in last December, I presented the data on overall survival, which shows a trend, positive trend in whole population, both in GPRACA and non-GPRACA population. So all that uh, said, you can see how we have changed uh, the outcome of our patient. This is the real world evidence from SEER data, uh, where you can see that uh, that uh, uh, the uh, incidence of 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 uh, 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 of of, of uh, ovarian cancer is gradually falling. However, the prevalence is increasing tremendously after introduction of uh, PARP inhibitors. So in relapsed disease, in so-called platinum-resistant disease, there's not much to offer. These patients received always single-agent chemotherapy, and we did a, a really a trial uh, with bevacizumab, adding bevacizumab to that, which showed uh, that uh, clear benefit of combination of single-agent chemotherapy plus bevacizumab, both in progression-free survival and in symptom control. But we have not reached to any better offer in this uh, population. So this is a real unmet need. So I would conclude here saying that landscape of ovarian cancer management has changed dramatically. Ovarian cancer has changed to a chronic disease and more and more patients are getting cured. We are privileged to experience this ex unprecedented improvement in outcome for our patients. And thank you very much for your time. Good morning, and thank you for inviting me to have this lesson on the treatment of advanced and recurrent endometrial cancer. These are my disclosure. So for several years, uh, we consider endometrial cancer a good prognosis disease, but actually endometrial cancer remains the only gynecological malignancies with increasing incidence and mortality. While patients diagnosed at early stage have a very good prognosis, for patients diagnosed at advanced stage and for early risk patients with the risk factor survival at five years is only 17%. Carboplatin paclitaxel represent the standard first line treatment, but after platinum failure, whichever drug you use, the response rate is around 15% and the median overall survival is around 32 months. And there is no standard second line therapy following platinum failure. The GCA project clearly demonstrated that endometrial cancer is not a single disease, neither two diseases, as we consider for several years, endometrioid and non-endometrioid too. But basically, endometrial cancer is represented by four different tumors with different prognosis and different molecular characteristics and possibly different treatment. And the retrospective analysis of PORTEC-3 trial reported that polymute tumor, which represents 8% of endometrial cancer, has a very good prognosis. So probably this tumor will not require any kind of adjuvant treatment after surgery. On the opposite, P53 mute tumor, which represents 15%, percent of endometrial cancer have a very worse prognosis. These patients should be treated with chemotherapy in combination with radiation treatment, and they benefit most from chemotherapy. But probably in the future, we will use PARP inhibitor for this patient because these tumors are particularly enriched by homologous recombination deficiency in genes. MMLD tumor represents about 30% of endometrial cancer. This tumor uh, responds not so well to chemotherapy, and this tumor presents an elevated genomic instability and possibly a good substrate for using immune therapy. 
And lastly, non-specific molecular profile tumor. I think it's a miscellanea of tumor. And in the coming years, we will have more granularity on this tumor. They represent about 40% of endometrial cancer. What we know now is that they gain limited benefit from chemotherapy, a significant increase in progression-free survival according to PORTEC-3 analysis, but no benefit in terms of overall survival. But these tumors are particularly enriched by hormone receptor positive tumor and possibly may gain benefit for hormonal treatment. But in particular, I want to focus on DNA mismatch repair. As you know, microsatellites are short, repeated sequence of mononucleotide scattered through the human genome. Um, mismatch repair system is responsible for the surveillance and correction of errors during DNA replication and when it is not functional, a subset of this insertion and deletion can affect coding duration of the genome, thus resulting in the production of truncated functionally inactive protein that generate new antigen. And you know that new antigen represent a substrate for tumor infiltrated lymphocyte and immunologic activation. And all of this represent the rationale for using immunotherapy in this patient. Of note, endometrial cancer is among the solid tumor, the tumor with the higher incidence and prevalence of microsatellite instability because up to 30% of endometrial cancer present this characteristic. In this patient, when we try to use immunotherapy as a single agent, we obtain remarkable overall response rate ranging between 45 and 57 percent. And in particular, K-158 was the registrative phase two single arm trial of pembrolizumab in MMRD MSI high endometrial cancer patient. The trial reported a response rate of 48%, but of note, the earlier we use immunotherapy in our patient, the higher the response rate, which was 53% in patients who have received only one line, prior line of therapy and decreased to 44% in patients more retreated. Of note, the median PFS and the median HOHES were not reached in this patient, suggesting a long-term benefit in patients responding to immunotherapy. On the same way, another drug, dostarlimab, reported remarkable 44% of own response rate in the Garnet study in a mixed population of MSI and MSS endometrial cancer. But response rate was 43.5% in MSI high endometrial cancer. And also in this case, the earlier use of immunotherapy translate in a higher response rate, which reached 50%. Very, very interesting. The median duration of response was not reached and the probability to remain in response of two here was 84% suggesting a long-term benefit of this drug in MSI high endometrial cancer. And these data are so convincing that the two ongoing trials are comparing immunotherapy versus chemotherapy in the first-line treatment of advanced MSI high endometrial cancer in the K-Note C93 and got EN15 Pembrolizumab is compared to carboplatin paclitaxel, while in the ENGOT EN13 Domenica trial, Dostarlimab was compared to carboplatin paclitaxel in MMR deficient metastatic of advanced endometrial cancer. What about MSS? The activity of immunotherapy single agent in MMRP MSS disease is not so exciting, with response rate up to 13%. So there is a rationale in trying to 
combine immunotherapy with other agent in order to leveraging uh, I, um, immune um, immune therapy activity and also broadening the indication to immunotherapy. And in particular, there is a huge rationale in combining immunotherapy with anti-angiogenic agent because anti-WGF agent uh, normalize vascular to increase maturation of the dendritic cell and in consequence antigen presentation, increase T cell infiltration and traveling and downregulate PDL expression. And this is the rationale on at the basis of K note 775 trial, which compared the combo of pembrol and batinib versus physician choice chemotherapy between doxorubicin or weekly paclitaxel in a population of advanced or recurrent endometrial cancer who had failed at least one prior platinum based chemotherapy. Patients were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to receive the two treatment and the primary endpoint, co-primary endpoint were progression-free and overall survival. And the trial met both the primary endpoint. And a significant increase in progression-free survival was reported in MMRP, but also all CAMER population, and a significant increase on overall survival, around seven months increase in overall survival, was reported in MMRP and all CAMER population. An exploratory analysis pre-planned, but not powered, unfortunately, in MMRD patient reported a quite exciting 40% overall response rate in this population treated with pembrol and batinib and a significant increase in progression-free and overall survival, raising the question what is the best treatment for MMRP patient if immunotherapy single agent or the combo. Um, my point is that for most of these patients, immunotherapy single agent uh, should be preferred because the trade-off for this trial is represented by toxicity. In the registrative trial, 33% of patients discontinued the pembrol and batinib treatment because of toxicity, and around 70% of patients had an interruption of treatment, and 66% of them as a dose reduction. What kind of toxicity we have to expect? The typical toxicity of TKI inhibitor and immunotherapy, I mean hypertension, which was grade three or higher in up to 40% of patients, hypothyroidism, diarrhea, nausea, decreased appetite, vomiting and weight decrease, the most frequent of them. It's important for us to start managing this kind of toxicity, but also educate our patient to recognize this toxicity. And it is, it's important to know where the toxicity is expected. Hypertension and fatigue uh, occur quite soon, two weeks after starting treatment, while somatitis, uh, nausea, decreased appetite up to five weeks. And if we are prepared to manage uh, we will give our patient the best treatment and the treatment that increases overall survival and does not affect quality of life if we identify the proper dose. And the next uh, year at ASCO, probably we will have the results of this combo, pembrol and batinib, in comparison to carboplatin paclitaxel in the first line setting of advanced disease. And if this trial is positive, we will have another standard in first line. So actually, we have immunotherapy as a single agent or immunocombo for the treatment of MSI high and MSS endometrial cancer. And uh, how to choose, what are the considerations that uh, we can do? Uh, probably we need the better um, predictive biomarker of response to immunotherapy if we consider that in the population of MSI high patient, immunotherapy single agent provide 50% response rate, thus suggesting that we need to identify who are the patients who do not respond to immunotherapy single agent. And uh, at this regard, uh, uh, tumor mutational barner is a well-recognized uh, predictive biomarker of immunotherapy response. And you know there is a, a large overlap between MSI high and TMB uh, 
AI in endometrial cancer, large overlap, but not a complete overlap. So probably patients with the TMB high may respond even better to immunotherapy. This seems to be confirmed both in KNOT 158 and Garnet trial, in which a patient with MSI high and TMB high respond better to immunotherapy with respect to patient MSI high, TMB low, or in the Garnet trial where patient with TMB high responded to immunotherapy regardless the MMRT status. The second consideration is related to the pathway that uh, support the MSI high. We know that around 30% of endometrial carcinoma are MSI high, but only 2 to 5% of this situation is related to germline mutation of MMRD genes, germline or somatic mutation of MMRD genes. In the remaining cases, more than 70% of cases, the instability is related to MLHI promoter, MLHI1 promoter methylation. This is a completely different pattern. And preclinical studies suggest that this different pathway genomic or somatic MMR genes inactivation or promoter methylation of MLH1 may have different impact in terms of microenvironment tumor infiltrating lymphocyte. Possibly this may explain also a different response to immunotherapy. This is suggested in this phase one trial, phase two trial with pembrolizumab in 25 patients, in which patients presenting somatic MMR protein loss, a Lynch-like syndrome, experience a better response rate, progression-free and overall survival with respect to patient um, having the methylation, and this is also confirmed in this other experience on 18 patients in which this seems to be confirmed. Um, honestly, this data, in my opinion, merit of further exploration also because they were not confirmed in the Garnet trial, but for sure this is something that we need to address more and more in the future. How can we further broaden the indication of immunotherapy. We can combine immunotherapy with the chemotherapy. There is a strong rationale in doing it because chemotherapy may induce an immunogenic death and this uh, enhanced presentation of tumor-specific antigen and increase the cell activation. And the three trial um, has been recently concluded combining immunotherapy to chemotherapy, carboplatin, paclitaxel in the first line advanced setting. And you know, for one of them, the Ruby trial, we have a press release anticipated. The, the trial is positive, clinically and statistically positive, so with an advantage of the combination of the Starlimab to carboplatin, paclitaxel in first line. And another trial, the ENGOT EN11, is exploring this combination in the adjuvant setting, so earlier in the treatment strategies. But there is also a rationale in combining immunotherapy with PARP inhibitor, because PARP inhibitor enhances DNA damage, this increased new antigen, increased tumor infiltrated lymphocyte, and increase the CD8 um, T cell. Two phase two trial labs reporting interesting the signals of activity when we combine immunotherapy plus PLAP inhibitor in uh, advanced or recurrent endometrial cancer with overall response rate of about uh, 16%. Honestly, the recently published uh, uh, trial uh, with the Lazopa Ribavelumab uh, seems not to be so exciting uh, with 11% overall response rate, but the authors recently published an exploratory analysis evaluating the efficacy of the combo according to the uh, um, homologous recombination uh, alteration. And in patients with homologous recombination deficiency, the advantage in terms of progression-free and overall survival was significantly increased with respect to the other agent. So this is a signal. This is a signal of efficacy, and we are trying to explore if this combo 
uh, will further ameliorate the, the prognosis of our patient. Two trial, the Ruby two trial and the, the Duo a trial are exploring the combo of immunopar parp plus PARP inhibitor in the first line advanced setting of endometrial cancer. And if this trial are positive, possibly the standard will further and further change. So a very exciting moment to treat endometrial cancer. Cinderella is now a queen and endometrial cancer has uh, mm, represent a very, a very interesting tumor to treat. It is not a single tumor as we consider for several years, but at least four different tumors with the different treatment and more and more in the future, we will see what is the best treatment for each endometrial cancer subgroup. There is a large number of clinical trials ongoing and the results will be released in the coming one or two years that will further change the treatment algorithm. Thank you so much for your attention. Greetings from London. Thank you so much for um, inviting me to talk today in the Oncoalert uh, Colloquium and represent ESCO um, in the surgical advances of perioperative management of ovarian cancer. Thank you very much. So these are my disclosures. In order to understand the present and the future, sometimes we need to go back, back in the centuries and see how we all started. And the mother of abdominal tumor surgery was actually Jane Todd Crawford. She was a woman with a monstrous tumor that was operated um, by Dr. Fred McDowell in Kentucky in the US uh, and lived actually many decades later um, and died of old age to be able to live and, and tell the tale. Um, so Dr. McDowell explained the procedure to the patient. He explained to her that this was never attempted before. It had a high mortality risk. And the patient accepted, being aware, where she, being aware and knowing what uh, she goes into, rode on her horse and rode 60 miles from Green County to Kentucky to Dunwill to have the operation awake without anesthesia because there was no anesthesia back then, singing hymns. And then um, after the doctor removed the tumor intact, closed the abdomen, wrote all the documentations and the operative note in detail so that we are able to tell the story today, many centuries later. And he followed, he kept the patient for a month in, her, in his house. And then after the patient was fit enough to go home, she rode back into her horse and went home to live decades later. And um, Dr. Mark Dowley kept a longer term to visit her and see how she was doing. So... These lessons that were le learned from this first debulking are actually lessons that are highly significant even decades and centuries later. We see how important, adequate, and transparent informed consent is. The patient knew that this was a high-risk procedure. She knew what she was getting into, and she was appropriately coached. Concept of prehabilitation. Patient rode 60 miles, was fit enough, yeah? She rode 60 miles on a horse to go and... and, um, and, and and, and, and be present to her and, and, and go to be operated. The patients nowadays, they walk often to the theater. They are not being carried anymore or put on stretchers like we used to do in the past. The patient um, was fit enough and was deemed fit enough to undergo such a radicality of procedure. The doctor uh, saw that the entire tumor was removed. And then after all that was done, he took care that there was an appropriate and adequate documentation that even if teams and people who are not present at the operation, they knew what happened and they could understand how the whole course of the procedure was, um, which is exactly what uh, we demand from surgical notes and from for, and, and, and from operation maps, maps nowadays. And then, of course, surgery is never enough without the adequate perioperative care and postoperative care and without the longer-term oncologic support. Um, this is something that was in a very simple way done back then by this first doctor and something that we have now optimized and, and uh, perfectionized um, within our gynecology oncology community. So all these lessons are still reflected in our guidelines centuries later. Uh, we have issued within ESCO, the European Society of Gynecology, oncology which is a pioneer society in promoting and supporting um, the management of gynecological cancers in, in Europe and beyond. 
And we have said that all patients who go into these operations, they need to be informed about not just the risks and benefits, but also about the therapeutic alternatives so that they're able to make an informed consent um, about really what they want to and whether this is the right way to go for them. The patients need to be early and appropriately coached and educated so that they are, I always say to the patients, they, they need to play with us. They need to be our co-soldiers in the fight. And they can do that only they know, only if they know what they're getting into and only if they know what to expect, only if they know what procedures should on, or, or, or may be done, complications that might happen, how long the postoperative period is, and, and um, so that they prepare themselves ad adequately. And um, and also to proactively work against any, any expected risks. So the ESMO and the European Society of Medical Oncology and ESCO, they have sat together and they have issued consensus statements and guidelines that clearly issue that a complete site reduction of all macroscopic visible disease is the aim of any of such procedures so that the patient has um, the maximal uh, benefit. Uh, everything needs to be done and performed within a special setting. Remember back then was the house of this doctor. Now we have accredited um, and well-established and defined ovarian cancer centers um, so that we have the adequate infrastructure and training for those operations to happen without unnecessary morbidity and mortality. And all this has led to us as gynecology oncology community being able to take on more difficult patients, more challenging cases, higher tumor burden disease, yeah? patients that perhaps in the past and decades ago we would perhaps never operate. Patients who are older, who are more multimorbid, just because we have the infrastructure and the knowledge and the expertise to take them on. And so we have experienced currently a constant expansion of the anatomical limits of operability, not just the anatomical limits, but also limits in terms of patients' profile, comorbidities, and, and, and tumor disease. And we have now evidence, not just in unicentric, but also in multicentric analysis, that even in higher tumor load patients, that theoretically are actually patients who will always have a chronic disease and patients who theoretically won't be cured yeah um, with a very high probability of relapse even we have evidence that even by operating those patients and investing surgical effort we can prolong not just remission but also survival this is a nice study that we did um, in the uk in the uk we have the very big advantage of a centralized um, cancer care system so that all patients are actually documented um, and not just the surgical um, patients are being put into analysis but all patients without any bias regardless of their comorbidities and tumor status and uh, and age so we have compared two centers in the uk to cancer centers with a completely different philosophy and tradition in terms of in terms of of surgical radicality and also surgical ethos and we have seen that while um, the one center had um, operated 87% of the entire patient's collective and the other center uh, operated only 58% of the entire patient's collective. What we have seen is that the center who had a higher proportion of operated patients, it had actually a significantly higher survival as an overall cohort, as a center, compared to the other one with um, a less proportion of patients with a hazard ratio of 0 0.4, 0 0.3 and a half. So practically by putting the ingredient surgery into the whole recipe of management of ovarian cancer, we increase and we improve the survival by, by 60%. And we have then in the UK, again, because of all the um, advantages that we have in a centralized care system, um, Suda Sunda for Birmingham, who is um, has done a lot of work in that uh, in that area and also in quality of life of uh, of, of ovarian cancer patients who are operated. We did an ovarian uh, cancer audit. We did a multicenter analysis of many centers in the UK, cancer centers in the UK, uh, where we took patients with we took centers with different ethos, different um, philosophy and tradition, and we have divided them in centers with um, mainly high complexity surgery, intermediate complexity surgery, or lower complexity surgery, and what we have seen is that those centers who had the significantly higher surgical rates of intermediate or high complexity, the patient's collective of those centers had actually significantly higher survival compared to the centers with low complexity. 
as a whole patients cohort and um, appealing as authors that actually the utilization of radical surgery even in patients with higher tumor burden disease is the way to go and it is worth investing effort in those uh, in those patients so um what is the reality? The reality in ovarian cancer is that this remain difficult patients, this remain difficult surgeries that need a lot of infrastructure and expertise and support to be able to perform those operations. And again, talking um, about an example of a centralized care system where every patient is being put in, in the denominator and the older, again, again, saying uh, even the patients with extensive disease who are older, who will perhaps just die at home with ascites and no treatment, they are being put in the analysis. We have published uh, with the British Gynecology Cancer Society a couple of years ago, our ovarian cancer audit that had shown in very, in very cruel numbers what the reality is, which is not just limited in the UK, but I'm sure that any other country that would able to report with a denominator, all patients collected would actually show the same. What we have seen is that um, almost half of the patients uh, with, had, with ovarian cancer in uh, the UK never received surgery at any point in their journey. Uh, only around 29% uh, of them underwent, underwent primary surgery. Um, 7% received no surgery or no chemotherapy, 23% um, received chemotherapy but no surgery, chemotherapy followed by surgery, 22%, surgery followed by chemotherapy, 21%, and no surgery or chemotherapy at all, even 26%. So these are very, very important numbers that need to remind us the gaps that we need to fill as kind of oncology community for um, the improvement of care of, uh, of those patients. For that reason, we have within the BGCS, the British Gynae Cancer Society just published, and I'm very um, grateful again to the whole BGCS team for making this work happen. Um, we have published evidence-based population-derived quality performance indicator for ovarian cancer with denominators all patients and reportable by hospital trust, integrated cancer system and cancer alliance on a national level, so not just on a center level. And what we have uh, said is that the target of patients uh, who are diagnosed in, with ovarian cancer and, and, and receive any type of anti-cancer treatment should be 80%. Patients who, re who receive anti-cancer um, surgery, such reductive surgery, should be a minimum of 55% and optimal target of 70%. All patients should have recording of postoperative disease uh, so that we improve the overall surgical surgical care. And of course, um, the pilot to all this and the role model to all this was ESCO, was the European Society of Canadian Oncology, where uh, Dennis Curlot in 2016, and then um, when I took on the chair of the guidelines committee in 2020, we updated the quality indicators for certification of centers and accreditation of centers qualified for ovarian cancer surgery so that the patients and the doctors know where to send those patients and what is the best center that is qualified um, and able to perform um, this type of, of radical procedures. Um, so we have issued a map in, in Europe, but also goes beyond Europe, where uh, we see that we have currently um, 20 centers of excellence for advanced ovarian cancer surgery, in, in, in mainly in, in, the, in the European, geographical European space, and uh, 51 regular certified centers for advanced ovarian cancer surgery, so a total of um, 71 centers that are qualified per evidence-based and objective criteria um, to, to provide adequate care. So we have become all better nationally and internationally. We see here numbers published by many groups and many, and, ma and many authors that we operate our patients more, we operate them better, they live longer. And that is, of course, not just a combination, not, not just a result of surgery, but of combination effort of better systemic care and better um, surgical care. Examples from the Scandinavian countries, from the UK, from the US, across all levels, we see that we become better as, as a oncology community. And of course, when we do that, we need standardization and homogenization of care, and we need evidence-based guidelines. Yes, we all started with a patient coming to the horse, on her horse to us, and we all know how um, we as surgeons like traditions and, and sometimes in an alchemistic way, the way we were educated, this is how we go on. But we are past that. We really need to standardize and objectify our experience, our knowledge, and our care. 
um, through evidence-based guidelines. And this is something that uh, ERAS, the ERAS Society, um, has issued guidelines in uh, some time ago and then updated them in 2019, were very concrete um, keystones of how this patient should be treated perioperatively with adequate pre-admission, education, counseling, prehabilitation, a new concept now in ovarian cancer, um, nutritional support, uh, reduction of, of, uh, surgical, uh, of surgical site infections. And this has been even optimized even more with uh, the ESCO guidelines for the perioperative management for advanced ovarian cancer surgery, where we looked even be beyond errors. We looked a bit more holistic um, about uh, the optimization of perioperative care for those patients uh, with key opinion leaders in gynae and medical oncology, anesthetists, psycho-oncologists, microbiologists, hematologists, nutritionists, interventional radiologists, clinical nurse specialists. Um, and this is a piece of work that we were very proud to present to you in 2021. In our journal, International Journal of Gynae Cancer, where really you can read any question you might have how do I treat a patient? How do I operate a patient who has an aortic valve, has a factor five Leiden mutation and it's a debulking? What type of anticoagulation do I need to give her? What is the post-operative vaccination protocol after a splenectomy? So we try to um, be very comprehensive in and answer any questions uh, you might have. And these guidelines go beyond the conventional errors uh, so that we can uh, present you like a, like a guidance book uh, for your daily care. And then, of course, we have novel concepts and trends in ovarian cancer surgery. We have now standardized perioperative imaging. We have introduced sentinel principles. We have introduced fluorescence-guided surgery, minimally invasive techniques, very selected patient algorithms and very well-defined um, patient algorithms. And um, at the end, very important, we have learned how to pair surgical with systemic advances and how to actually integrate tumor biology and lessons that we have learned from tumor biology to, um, uh, our, to incorporate to our surgical effort. Um, just before the end of my talk, I'm just going to give you some examples of these uh, advances just as a taste for the future. We now have the fluorescence guided uh, surgery where we use it. Uh, we use the ICG yeah, for sentinel nodes uh, to check anastomotic perfusion to say after anastomosis to check the viability of the bowel after extensive stripping. Um, ureters, bladder, the same. Um, we have in uh, Imperial College developed the eye knife. The eye knife is a, um, a rapid evaporation operative ionization mass spectrometry system where we can during the surgery see the margins and see whether what we operate is scar tissue or not scar tissue cancer or not cancer uh, especially after neoadjuvant chemotherapy whether it is um, chemotherapy scar tissue or real cancer we have now learned how to integrate artificial intelligence for our benefit, uh, we have now learned how to um, take conventional CT images and actually apply radiomics, novel radiomics techniques, and, and use them as predictors for clinical and surgical outcome. Um, these are here radiomics pictures and data that we have um, developed in Imperial and also many other centers do that. Uh, we have established and defined the RPV. This is the radiomic prognostic vector, uh, which shows independently of any surgical effort and any residual disease that patients with an RPV high group, they have a much lower overall survival compared to an RPV low group. And that way, we perhaps can try in the future to stratify better patients in a way that we, we concentrate our surgical effort to those patients who will benefit most. And, and and we divert patients who will not benefit from um, radical surgery to other alternative techniques. And we're able to validate that in, uh, in, in the UK in a center of excellence and validate that also in another center of excellence in Essen, in the center of Philip Hata and Andreas de Bois. And we are in the process now also of a further analysis in other uh, big centers in Europe. And we have shown that this is not just about an image. Um, the RPV was strongly related to biological pathways. RPV high patients had a more stroma pa enriched pathway as opposed to RPV low patients who had a more DDR enriched pathway. So we see how everything makes sense really in vivo and in vitro and how we can understand tumor biology better for our patients. And for that reason, any 
new study, any new analysis currently needs to be associated with a translational aspect. We need tumor banks, we need biobanks where we um, uh, store tumor tissue, blood, urine. And here are the examples of some of the largest tumor banks in the world where collaborative efforts have, have put in together thousands and thousands of patients, not just with clinical data, not just with, with, uh, with, with, um, with study data, but with actual biomaterial so that we are able to implement any, any clinical knowledge to, to, to implement it and, and convert it into translational uh, aspects so that we understand better the disease. And of course, at the end, I always plead and say that we have done such a massive effort in the systemic advances. And sometimes people ask me whether we actually need to bother with surgery since we now can give a PARP inhibitor and everything can melt away. So actually it doesn't go like that. How it goes is that the better we go and we become in one in, in one level, that equally we have to be better also in another level and we have to pair effort and combine effort so that we have a maximal package of care and not just one um, weapon over the other. Uh, we have here the PARP inhibitor data from the solo one where we see that the patients who had the least residual disease had derived actually the most benefit from the PARP inhibitors. We see here, these are the Paola data, the patients with a low risk disease who were stage three operated tumor free and where HRD positive, they actually had a hazard ratio of 0.15. So 85% improvement through addition of PARP inhibitors compared to no PARP inhibitors um, in terms of a better package of care. So we see that um, it's not just one, um, one therapeutic effort over the other, but how to combine to combine both. At the end, what is very important is that when we talk about survival, when we report about surgery, we not only take and evaluate surgical patients, but all patients with ovarian cancer. So any future studies need to report as a denominator all patients with ovarian cancer, because this is actually what is essential for benchmarking and quality standards in our, in our, in our field. So ovarian cancer for bodies, we have national and international collaborative efforts to standardize and homogenize surgical care. I'm very happy and very proud to be able to say that, and we will become even better and better. We have now a clear definition of surgical metrics and quality indicators for objective assessment, accreditation, and benchmarking of centers and surgical alliances. We now are in a position to utilize and incorporate novel bioengineering, translational imaging and technical advances for the benefit of our surgical success. And at the end, what matters is, is the package maximal effort treatment care for the best, um, for the best management, management of our patients. Thank you very much. Exciting times to come. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me back for the 2022 OncoAlert Colloquium. My name is Allison Bethoff Warner. I'm an assistant attending physician at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center on the melanoma service, and I'll be here to give you our 2022 melanoma updates. These are my disclosures, and you can also find them linked to my profile in Twitter. Um, so here's what we're going to hit on. There was a lot to cover in 2022. We're going to start with adjuvant therapy for stage two disease move into some updates in adjuvant therapy for stage three and stage four resected melanoma, dive into neoadjuvant therapy, which saw a lot of advances this year, and finish up with some new, new data in metastatic disease. So let's drive right in. So why would we even consider adjuvant therapy for stage two melanoma? So if we look on the left, these are the stage three melanoma specific survival curves. And if you look at stage three A, we're looking at 88% 10 year melanoma specific survival, stage three B, 77%, 60% for three C, 24% um, for stage three D. And typically at least in three B through three D, we really think about the importance of adjuvant therapy for these patients and preventing recurrence. That being said, if we compare stage 2B melanoma and 2C melanoma, what you see is their 10-year melanoma-specific survival um, is actually worse um, than stage 3A and even, for in the case of stage uh, 2C, worse than 3B. 
And so this really raises the question of whether or not we should be thinking about Advent therapy for these patients as well. So Keynote 716 is a randomized trial of pembrolizumab versus placebo for stage 2B and 2C melanoma. Patients were randomized one-to-one -to, -one, um, to either pembrolizumab or placebo um, and then followed um, until recurrence, um, at which point they were unblinded if patients were treated uh, uh, either way, patients could be rechallenged or uh, or crossed over from a placebo arm to treatment with pembrolizumab. Primary endpoint was recurrence-free survival per investigator assessment. So we saw this published this year uh, by Jason Luke et al. Um, and what you're looking for is recurrence-free survival on the y-axis um, and months going out to 33 months um, on the x-axis. And you see uh, pembrolizumab arm in blue, uh, placebo arm in red, um, significantly improved uh, recurrence-free survival with pembrolizumab with a hazard ratio of 0.61. We had some updates to these data this year. Georgina Long at ASCO here presented the distant metastasis-free survival data. Um, very important when we think about recurrences, whether or not they could be local and potentially resectable versus true distant metastasis. Um, so this is very important data. Um, and what we saw is the um, number of events for pembrolizumab um, was 63, the number of events for placebo 95 with a hazard ratio of 0.6, and that was statistically significant. Um, now, the flip side of that is the toxicity of that in this group. So if we think about um, adverse events, uh, grade three, grade four adverse events, 17% in the pembrolizumab arm versus 4.3% in the placebo arm, 16% leading to discontinuation in the pembro arm versus 25 in the placebo arm. So pretty marked difference between the groups as one would expect. Um, but what are those toxicities? So um, some of the area of concern here is that these are potentially permanent toxicities for some of these patients. So a total of 107 patients um, or 22% of those treated with pembrolizumab experienced an adverse event of interest that included these uh, endocrinopathies. 20% um, of uh, that, so um, 98 of the 107 patients were treated with hormone replacement therapy. Um, if we are looking here, um, hypothyroidism, um, hypo hypophysitis, 2.5% uh, of patients, adrenal insufficiency, 2.5% of patients, and importantly, two cases, one diabetes. Um, which, as we all know, can be problematic and very difficult to manage. Um, additionally, this year, we saw the presentation of Checkmate 76K, which was a similar trial of nivolumab versus placebo in stage 2B, 2C uh, melanoma. This was presented by Georgina Long at the Society for Melanoma Research this fall. Um, this was a similar study designed, except patients were randomized 2 to 1 to nivolumab versus placebo. Um, and what you can see here, uh, you have a um, nice separation of these curves um, with a hazard ratio of 0.42, and that is statistically significant. And when you look at distant metastasis-free survival, these curves indeed are still statistically significantly different, favoring the nivolumab arm. Um, with 92% uh, distant metastasis-free survival at 12 months in the NEVO arm versus 87% in the placebo arm um, for a hazard ratio of 0.47. Um, very similar adverse event profile broken down slightly differently, um, but quite similar to what we have seen in the past with PD-1. So we did see an approval this year of um, adjuvant pembrolizumab for the treatment of uh, stage 2B and 2C melanoma. Given the uh, controversy around the um, 
the toxicity, there's still a lot of question in our field about which patients should get this therapy. Uh, but I expect more to be sorted out in the years to come. Um, but lots of advancement in this area. What about stage three and stage four disease? So we got some long-term updates from the stage three adjuvant trials. So um, key here, Checkmate 238, which was a randomized trial of nivolumab versus ipilimumab for stage 3B through 4 disease. Um, Keynote 054, which was pembrolizumab versus placebo for stage 3A through 3C. Um, and Combi AD, which is dibrafenib trametinib versus placebo for 3A through 3C disease. Um, it is important to note that that staging was still using the AJCC7 staging um, because that was what was available at the time of these studies. So if we look at the five-year recurrence-free survival across these trials, uh, with all of the caveats that we should not make cross-trial comparisons, um, if we look at Checkmate 238, the five-year recurrence-free survival was 50%, with a five-year distant metastasis-free survival of 58%. Uh, for Keynote 054, you had a five-year recurrence-free survival of 55% and a five-year distant metastasis-free survival of 61%. And for Combi AD, 52% and the distant metastasis-free survival of 65%. So overall, some updates to these data that do look quite promising that, uh, again, um, speak to the importance of adjuvant therapy um, and the considerations around adjuvant therapy for patients with stage three and stage four resected disease. We also saw more data coming out from the Immuned trial, which was a stage four resected trial of nivolumab plus ipilimumab versus nivolumab plus placebo versus placebo alone. These patients were randomized one to one to one um, and then followed up. So uh, this was published this year in the Lancet. Um, if we look on the left, you're looking at recurrence-free survival. So this top curve, nivolumab plus um, if that's compared to placebo in the green, you have a hazard ratio of 0.25 that is statistically significant. Nivolumab versus placebo, so nivolumab here in blue, um, was a hazard ratio of 0 0.60 versus placebo, again, statistically significant. And nivolumab plus ipilimumab versus nivolumab um, has a hazard ratio of 0.41 um, that is also statistically significant. So this would suggest, uh, if we looked at these data alone, um, strongly favoring the nivolumab plus ipilimumab arm. However, if you look over at these curves on the right um, on overall survival, again, uh, this is the nivolumab plus ipilimumab arm, Blue is nivolumab, green is placebo. If we look at nivolumab plus, plus, plus ipilimumab versus placebo, no surprise there, that hazard ratio is uh, 0.41, and that is statistically significant. But if we look at nivolumab versus placebo in terms of overall survival, there is not a statistically significant overall survival benefit to using adjuvant nivolumab. And if we look at nivolumab plus ipilimumab versus nivolumab alone, um, again, has a ratio 0.55 that is not statistically significant for overall survival. Um, when we look at the adverse event profile uh, for the Nevo plus ipi arm treatment-related adverse events, grade three, grade four, 71% uh, versus 27% for Nevo alone, versus 6% for placebo, and treatment-related adverse events leading to discontinuation, 53% uh, for Nevo plus IPI, 9% for Nevo, and zero for placebo. So really important when we think about no overall survival benefits um, and looking at these differences in toxicities, these data really don't support using Nevo plus IPI in this setting. Um, Checkmate 915 similarly looked at um, Nevo plus IPI in the adjuvant setting uh, versus Nevo alone for stage 3B through 3D or stage four resected melanoma. Uh, these patients were randomized one-to-one -to, -one, um, to 
the Nevo um, plus low dose Ipi, uh, Ipi one milligram per kilogram to six weeks versus standard dosing of nivolumab. Primary endpoints was recurrence free survival um, in the PDL1 less than 1% population. And we saw these data published this year by Jeff Weber et al. in uh, Journal of Clinical Oncology. And you can see the complete overlap of these curves, um, suggesting really no real benefit in recurrence free survival to the addition of nivolumab plus sipilimumab versus nivolumab alone and certainly um, higher toxicity. Uh, you can just start here, 32.6%, uh, grade three, grade four toxicity versus 12.8% grade three, grade four in nivolumab alone. Um, again, so I think this, these data combined really suggest that Nevo plus Ipi is probably not the adjuvant, adjuvant regimen of choice. Um, and right now we are still focused on PD-1 alone in that setting. All right, moving on, uh, whirlwind tour, moving on to neoadjuvant therapy. Um, so lots of talk over the last few years about neoadjuvant therapy, um, but we've been anxiously awaiting the data from particularly this trial, SWOG 1801, which was neoadjuvant pembrolizumab versus adjuvant pembrolizumab for resectable stage 3B through stage 4 disease. Um, and the primary endpoint for this study was event-free survival. So in the neoadjuvant arm, patients were randomized to three cycles of pembrolizumab every three weeks, then underwent surgery, and then completed another 15 cycles of pembrolizumab. In the adjuvant arm, patients went straight to surgery, then had 18 cycles of pembrolizumab, um, again, followed for your rent free survival. This is really important. These patients got exactly the same dose of pembrolizumab. They got exactly the same number of cycles. The only thing that was different was the timing of the surgery and whether the tumor was in situ uh, at the time that treatment was started for neoadjuvant therapy. Um, so if we look at the event free survival curves, these were presented by Dr. Satna Patel at ESMO this year. Um, strongly, strongly favoring neoadjuvant therapy over adjuvant therapy. Um, hazard ratio was 0.58. This was statistically significant. Um, and you can see that 21% of patients um, had a pathologic CR in the neoadjuvant group. Um, if we look at overall survival, these data are immature. There have only been 36 deaths reported at this point. Um, this difference is not statistically significant at this point. Um, and there were no new safety uh, signals identified. Rates of treatment-related adverse events were similar in both arms. And neoadjuvant pembrolizumab did not increase adverse events in the perioperative period, which is a key consideration when we think about giving neoadjuvant therapy. Um, another study in the neoadjuvant space, which we have seen um, increasing attention to, is this study of, uh, it was a phase two non-randomized study, single arm neoadjuvant nivolumab plus relatlimab. Um, so patients with stage 3B through 3D or oligometastatic stage four melanoma, um, they could not have had any prior uh, checkpoint exposure. There were 30 patients in this trial. Uh, they were given neoadjuvant uh, relatlimab plus nivolumab for two cycles then taken to surgical resection, followed by another 10 cycles of adjuvant uh, Nevo plus Rela, and then followed up. The primary endpoint for this study was pathologic CR. And you can see on the left here, 57% of patients had a pathologic CR. Um, another 7% had a near pathologic CR, which is one to 10% viable tumor. Um, a partial uh, uh, pathologic P partial response was another 7% of patients. Um, and then the pathologic non-responders, um, which had greater than 50% viable tumor, was only 27% of patients. And um, you can see the waterfall plots here. And interestingly, the as many of us had su suspected, the radiographic uh, rates actually underestimate 
the pathologic CR rate. So 57% of patients had an overall radiographic response as depicted here. Um, and 19 of the patients with a pathologic CR or near path CR, one of those actually had radiographic progression of disease, three had radiographic stable disease, and 15 of those patients had radiographic partial responses. Um, so emphasizing the importance of actually getting the tissue in these patients as uh, radiology may not be the most reliable metric. If we look at um, uh, recurrence-free survival, for those patients who had a pathologic response, the recurrence-free survival, quite promising um, versus those patients who did not have a pathologic response, this difference is statistically significant. Um, and this is a single arm study. So this, these are the overall survival curves um, that look quite good out to 35 months. Um, so what's the toxicity here? Um, typical things that we would expect with immunotherapy, adrenal insufficiency, transaminitis, uh, hyponatremia, um, myalgias and CPK increases were seen. There were no treatment-related adverse events of grade three or greater in the neoadjuvant setting. Um, and 26% uh, of the patients had grade three or higher toxicity in the adjuvant setting. Um, but again, not, uh, not the significant events in the neoadjuvant setting that would lead to surgical delay. All right, last but not least, we're on to metastatic disease. So what are the updates here? So Relativity 047 we saw presented last year. This is the randomized trial of relatlimab plus nivolumab versus nivolumab alone, uh, frontline for metastatic disease. We saw this published this year in the New England Journal of Medicine by Hussein Taubi et al. Um, with a median progression-free survival in the nivorella arm of 10.12, um, months versus uh, 4.63 months in the NEVO arm uh, for a hazard ratio of 0.75. That is statistically significant. Um, we saw some updates to these data. These are the overall survival data presented by uh, Dr. Georgina Long at ASCO this year. Um, there was not a statistically significant difference um, in overall survival, but you can see uh, some separation of the curve. So it'll be interesting to see um, how these data mature over time. Um, so treatment-related adverse events um, in the NEVO versus RELA will focus on grade three, grade four. Um, basically 19% in the um, NEVO plus RELA arm versus 9.7, 10-ish percent in the NEVO arm, um, leading to treatment discontinuation. 8.5% versus 3.1%. So there is a trade-off in toxicity for this uh, improvement in um, progression-free survival. And again, this has opened questions about whether or not this is always the appropriate frontline regimen for patients, how this fits in versus single-agent PD-1 for certain frailer patients, how this fits in versus um, uh, ipilimumab plus nivolumab, those are questions we expect to be answered in the coming years. Um, I did want to make note of um, one important development that we have seen in 2022 as well, um, which was TIL therapy for melanoma. So we saw the uh, results from C the C4401 trial, which was lipolusal for PD-1 refractory melanoma. Lipolusal is a TIL therapy um, in which patients undergo resection of a tumor. Um, ex vivo expansion of TILs, they then undergo lymphodepletion, um, TIL infusion, and several doses of high-dose IL-2. Um, we had previously seen results from cohort two of this uh, data set. We now have updated results from cohorts two plus four. Uh, the eligibility criteria for those uh, were basically identical, and these are all patients who had progressed on prior PD-1-based regimens. You see here an overall response rate of 31.4%. These were presented by Dr. Amod Sarnayak at SITSI this year. Um, the median duration of response was not yet reached, important because this is a one-time treatment. Um, and the median overall survival for this group, 17.4 uh, months, um, which is uh, quite promising for a PD-1 refractory group. 
41.7% of the responses were maintained for greater than 24 months. Um, and so overall, uh, really some promising data for TIL for PD-1 refractory melanoma, uh, the 12 month overall survival rate was actually 54%. If we look at the safety profile, this has always been the trade-off for TIL. We know that there are um, a higher risk of adverse events. The safety profile here, um, what you can see here is that the adverse events are really concentrated in the first two-ish, two and a half weeks. They're related predominantly to the lymphodepleting chemotherapy, things like the febrile neutropenia um, and thrombocytopenia, and then related to the IL-2 therapy, things like um, chills, fevers, um, and even hypotension. Um, but these resolve quite quickly. Um, and so, uh, again, um, suggesting that this may be a really viable therapy um, for patients with PD-1 refractory melanoma. And this is actually um, currently under consideration by the FDA for potential approval. We also saw beautiful data from uh, Dr. John Hannon and his group at ESMO 2022. Um, with a similar TIL product, uh, randomized versus ipilimumab for patients with unresectable um, stage three or stage four melanoma, they could have progressed on a prior maximum of, of one or uh, zero or one lines of prior therapy. Um, patients were randomized one to one uh, to either TIL or ipilimumab. Um, what you can see here, this was published in the New England Journal this year. Um, the, uh, this is the TIL arm um, for progression-free survival in red versus ipilimumab. Quite excellent separations of these curves, a hazard ratio of 0.5 um, that is statistically significant. And you can see some uh, profound differences in uh, progression-free survival. Um, objective response rates, this is TIL on the left, ipilimumab on the right, um, complete response rates to um, TIL versus ipilimumab, again, higher. Um, there are higher adverse events rates, of course, in the TIL arm as expected um, versus ipilimumab, and certainly uh, only TIL has adverse events related to chemotherapy. Um, I expect that the next year to two years, we'll see a lot more data uh, in the TIL space and particularly TIL for PD-1 refractory melanoma um, and even potentially an FDA approval. So lots of progress this year, very exciting. Um, I'm sorry for all the other studies that I couldn't cover. It was a huge year for melanoma. Um, and I wanna say thank you to Onco Alert and all of our partners for putting on this symposium. And please feel free to reach out via Twitter, Dr. Betzoff, MD, PhD, if you have any questions. Hello, and a very warm welcome in this short video on the Time to Act Data Navigator. My name is Mirjam Krul. I work as a hospital pharmacist in Amsterdam in the Netherlands and in the European Cancer Organization, I co-chair a focused topic network on the effects of the COVID pandemic on cancer care. I do that together with Professor Lawler from Belfast in Ireland. Time to Act was a campaign that we did in the European Cancer Organization to try to mitigate the effects of COVID on cancer care. We wanted to take a data-driven approach, so we gathered as much data as we could find uh, that assess the effects of COVID on cancer and cancer patients. Currently, there are over 300 peer-reviewed publications on this topic available. So we collated all of these data and this is what we found. Especially in the beginning of the pandemic, in the first year, our doctors across Europe saw one and a half million fewer cancer patients. In addition, 100 million cancer screening tests were not performed. Also, we noticed that the patients who were under treatment did not receive their treatment in time in half of the cases. All of this together has led us to calculate that around one million people in Europe might have cancer but have not yet been diagnosed. 
Also, there has been a toll on the mental health of both patients as well as healthcare workers. So when we had all of these data, we wanted to make them available and visual. And therefore we built an internet website where per country we gathered the data we had and you can click on each country to see how we were doing. Initially we had 17 countries in Europe. This was well received by the European Commission and the Parliament and also by others and we even won a prize for this project. But just gathering the data once is not enough. So we upgraded it and we added more studies and more countries. And you can also now look at the impact of COVID on specific tumor types. In addition, we make it possible to do a year by year review to see how the data are um, progressing over time. Unfortunately, even though COVID uh, pandemic is not as severe now as it used to be, we are not out of the woodworks. We still see decreases in diagnosis, for example, in this slide in Germany and in Austria, and also data are starting to come in that we see patients with later stages when they are diagnosed. We will not stop this work and we still can use more data if we have missed some. So there is a button on the website where you can contact us if you find data that have not been added to our tool as yet. So these are all the findings. They are freely available, but of course only data does not solve the problem yet. So after we found the data, we have written policy recommendations. We want to see from countries where the figures are less severe how they manage that so that we can learn and we can build back stronger. Our first um, effort was a report we wrote with a lot of the member societies of the European Cancer uh, Organization contributing. We launched that in 2021 and you can see a highlight of the seven points we addressed. Of course, first and foremost, the backlog had to be resolved, but also we saw and we are still seeing that there are shortages, not only in medicines or equipment, but also in staff. We needed to restore the confidence and we needed to employ innovative technologies because going back to how it was before is not enough if we want to catch up on this backlog. And this can only be done by using more innovative technologies and using a data-driven approach to see how we're doing. Self-evident, of course, is that we have learned from the COVID pandemic that a good pan-European health cooperation is pivotal. So this was our initial policy message, and we are currently in the status of updating that. Uh, we will write an update to see what we have learned in the last year and to um, implement that in a new report. Our aim is um, that we will continue to rebuild stronger, to learn from best practices, and of course that should lead to doing better next time, although I hope there is no next time. We have to resolve the weaknesses that were exposed by the COVID pandemic so that we can continue to give the best care to all of our cancer patients. If you'd like to learn more, please visit the European Cancer Organization's website or contact us. Thank you very much. Dear colleagues, thank you very much for joining us today for this day four and please joining us tomorrow when we'll be covering GI malignancies by Drs. Eng, Lewis, Gill, Sanford, Zhu, and Ms. Rosen, along with great SO and SEOG sessions by Dr. Williams and Ms. Apostolidis of the European Cancer Patient Coalition. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow and thank you for your attention. Until then, thank you for sharing this colloquium and thank you for being on Google Alert.